ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Schmodown Rundown. Introducing first, Frankie Stats Janish. And their co host, the man of controversy, Mr. Brian the Duke David. And finally, your host, Aaron Turner. Let's get ready to Schmodown. What's up, Movie Trivia Schmodown fans? This is episode number 44 of the Schmodown Rundown. My name is Brian Davids, and I'll be your host for tonight's team recap as Aaron Turner is still on assignment, or is he? Joining me once again is the stat commander, Winky, one of the deepest Chicagoans I know, Mr. Frankie J. How's it going, Hodges? Stat Commander, I like that one. I usually hear Stat Lord, Frankie Numbers, every everything else, Frankie McStat Stats, but uh, Stat Commander, I can I can get on board with that one. It's not just Stat Commander, it's Stat Commander Winky. <laughs> oh, all right, I'll remember that part. Well, on this special episode, one of the Schmodown's greatest champions, Jeff Snyder, will join us to recap the Patriots team title match against Modoc, the artist formerly known as Rotten Tomatoes. We might even hear from a couple other lions as well. We'll also be talking a little news, paying another visit to the Ward Wing, and sharing our bracketology plans for the Ultimate Schmodown Team Tournament. Before we get into news, I just want to indulge in myself for a minute because tonight's episode marks my one-year anniversary on the SK Plus channel. So at the end of the episode, I will wax poetic about my experience on this channel. So, Frank, are we ready to get to news? I think we are, and I just want to say congratulations on making it one year in this crazy, crazy fandom community. What do I win? You win a set of stick knives, and it's in the mail as we speak. Thank you. (laughs) We interrupt our scheduled programming to bring you this breaking news. Wicked City's Heather Grace Hancock, a.k.a. HGH, revealed... On today's Collider TV Talk, that the movie trivia glowdown is coming. I don't have any other details at this time or what actors are scheduled to appear, but we reported last week that we've got several celebrity matches in the works, so this appears to be one of them. Frank, does the movie trivia glowdown excite you? Yeah, when I heard it, I thought this was really awesome giving the wrestling Influence, angle. Influence, yes, thank you. The wrestling influence that the Schmodown has. And look, at, I'll be honest, I have yet to watch Glow on Netflix, but I will certainly make it a point to in the near future to be up to date when this match happens. You can't ask for a more fitting show to promote via the Schmodown. Glow is about the development of a women's wrestling show. And as Schmodown fans, We've all witnessed the growth and development of this movie trivia show that is inspired by the dramatic flair of wrestling entertainment. The Schmodown is a unique and fun way for studios to promote their properties, and in this case, there's a mutual benefit as each property's fans would be interested in the other. So, Glow is a good show, and with Season 2 just being announced, I recommend getting caught up with Season 1. It was good, but Season 2 has the potential to be great. However, I've just received late-breaking word that Team Trek and Cinema Blend is now being moved to August 22nd. The team tourney will now begin a few days later than expected, as a TBD match is taking its place on August 18th. You don't have to go back to the beginning of the season to put some money on the Cubbies because you can bet some right now that the Glow match, the movie trivia Glowdown, is dropping on Friday, August 18th. Moving on to our next item, in honor of James Bond taking over the Schmodown of late, Android and Robert Meyer Burnett announced that their team name will be called Blofeld's Cat. This makes me laugh since the Bond category may not last very long in inner geekdom at least. So Frank, any reactions to Blofeld's cat? Blofeld's cat is... Blofeld, no feel. Blofeld, Blofeld, excuse me. I'm not really that geeky 
in terms of Bond. So Blofeld's cat didn't really have Blofeld. Blofeld. Like Seinfeld. <laughs> Seinfeld. Blofeld didn't have any kind of meaning towards me, but I'm sure it did for other Bond fans. But I'm looking forward to seeing Andrako and Burnett compete in the Ultimate Schmodown. That's really what I'm looking for. The name is fine. If you're if you're a fan of the Bond, I think that does a little something extra for you. Didn't really do it for me. For me. Because I'm not that big of a Bond fan. But nonetheless, I am looking forward to what Burnett and Andrako can do. And perhaps, perhaps get to the final and then we'll see what kind of fireworks go from there. Spoiler alert for the last Bond film, Spectre. Blofeld is played by Christoph Waltz. So for the uninitiated, that is Blofeld. Blofeld is basically the con to James Bond. Okay. Con is to Kirk as Blofeld is to Bond. Anyways, Frank, I meant to follow up on this earlier this week, but last week we talked more about this theory that I've had for a while and how announcers appear to be improving their game by calling matches. I first posited this theory when discussing Christian's epic streak as of collision, as well as when Fredo Knapsack was caught answering a question he read just a week prior as a broadcaster. However, I left out a key point, and that point is Mark Ellis. Mark Ellis won the Ultimate Schmodown Singles Tournament last year. Mark Ellis is also an announcer. So as it stands, everyone who's logged serious time at both tables has enjoyed success when it comes to playing. So regardless of what side of the camera you're on, watching the Schmodown is bound to improve just about anyone's trivia game. Absolutely. I've learned mounds of trivia just watching the Schmodown ever since it came to Collider and as well as when it was before Collider. So to think that anyone else wouldn't pick up some any kind of trivia knowledge along the way, I think is selling everyone short. But that's the thing. When you hear multiple choice options, you're reminded of films you probably haven't thought about in a while. When someone gives a wrong answer, you think about that answer. There's process of elimination when it comes to certain answers. So you're thinking about films. Oh, it can't be that one because of this, this, and this. So you are waking up certain sides of your movie memory that you haven't accessed in a while. And that is why just watching and being around even as an announcer is beneficial. So again, I just had to bring up Mark Ellis because that's a perfect example of an announcer that went on to have great success. So it's no surprise that Christian is following in his footsteps with his epic streak. So we'll see how it turns out coming up. Now, Frank, are you ready to visit the ward wing? Oh, let's do it, buddy. This is art, Mr. White. The chosen one, Brian Ward, strikes again with a play on the Last Jedi celebration poster, the best poster Star Wars has made since the 70s, as far as I'm concerned. The Patriots warranted the Luke and Kylo Ren spots, but if you look closely, you can see Modox, Gray, and Matt attempting to restore balance to the Force with a wheel behind them. My favorite part is that Atchity is still in his Tommy Bahamas gear. I asked Brian about this poster, and he said he didn't realize how much added meaning the poster would have following the match. The Last Jedi doesn't come out until December, and this win for the Patriots means we won't see them until December either. Instead of life imitating art or art imitating life, you could say that this poster could very well be art imitating art. Well, check out more of Brian's work at brianeward.com and follow him on Twitter at Brian E. Ward. The force is strong with that one. Now, Frank, before we dive into the Patriots Modoc recap with Jeff Snyder, it's time for another episode of Where in the World is Booker T? Frank Booker is back in Fuddrucker studio, making sure to pick a new angle just to surprise us rundowners. Being the wise man that he is, 
Booker picked the Patriots as he wants them to make Modoc say daddy. I love that line. Make him scream daddy because that is so true. The run that the Patriots have been on has really put the pressure on all their opponents from the very beginning, from the first two rounds. And to hear Booker T exert that Patriots are so good that they can make anybody scream daddy. I thought that was a great, great line that Booker T uh, gave everyone. And hey, if you're listening to this, you all know how the match worked out. So you know how prophetic those words were. I love Booker T's segment. He's got a big announcement for his show, Reality of Wrestling. Keep up the good work, Booker. Once again, having a Hall of Fame wrestler with his amount of clout endorse the show, it's going to pay dividends for the league in the long run. I really hope people understand how important this is, but man, I just love watching the guy, even in two-minute chunks. But enough of our preamble, Frank. It's time to recap the team title match between the Patriots and MODOK. Frank? Frank? Frank, where are you going? Frank, where are you going? Frank, Jeff is waiting. He's waiting. You don't make champions wait, Frank. He's not a pizza guy. Frank! Frank! You've just signed our death warrants. You know that, right? Harloff is going to bury us like Shoesy Pants and Captain Learning. Who do you expect me to call at the last minute? Sorry, folks. You'd think we'd have our act together for a champion like Jeff Snyder. Listen to this iTunes commercial while I figure this out. Hey, everyone. Aaron Turner here, the host of this fine program, The Schmodown Rundown. Do you want to help us out? Great. If you're listening via iTunes, please rate and review the Schmoes No iTunes feed. It helps us out tremendously. It helps us get on top of the charts. That way more people can find us and listen and we can get more fans invested in the Schmo Down and that's what it's all about. If you're listening via YouTube or watching, staring at Brian Ward's amazing artwork, please give us a thumbs up and leave a comment in the section below. Please do so. But also, don't forget to check out the other shows on the SK Plus channel, such as the Harloff Podcast, The Wenger Show, the newly returning Top 10 Show with John Roca and Matt Nose. Also, rebroadcast of the Schmoes No Live Show in case you missed it live. And there's other shows on the channel that you catch every single day. We appreciate it. Follow us on Twitter at SD Rundown. Email us anytime, schmodownrundown at gmail.com. And now back to me? Okay, back to me. All right, we're joined by the editor in chief of tracking board.com, the host of Popcorn Talks, Meet the Movie Press. And last but not least, the other half of the greatest championship entity the Schmodown has ever seen. It's the Patriot himself, Jeff the In Snyder Snyder. Thanks for having me, guys. Seven and oh in teams, baby. Seven and oh. Jeff, this title bout may have been the greatest match I've ever seen. How are you feeling right now? Dude, that shit came down to the what? Can I swear on this podcast? I always forget. Within reason. It came down to the wire. I honestly was not expecting such a good match. I, I knew, actually knew his stuff. Um, I didn't think great Drake would be as good as she proved to be. So a lot of props to our competitors. You know, I think the experience with the, the five-round championship format really uh, proved to, you know, be our benefit. It's worth pointing out that we have called someone off the bench to appear on this very recap right now. You might know him as the host of this actual program. Aaron Turner, how are you tonight? I'm just happy to be in the presence of greatness, of championship <laughs> nobility. I don't get off the pine for everybody. I don't come out from the bullpen for just anybody. So I'm well, here with Jeff, and this is awesome. I'm flattered. Thank you very much, guys. Aaron Turner, can you believe that Jeff Snyder and JTE have defended the belt four times in 2017? Is it bad that I say that I'm not surprised because I know how good they are and I knew how good they were from Jump Street. So it doesn't surprise me that they keep winning. Honestly, I'm a little surprised. Like when when they told me, you know, around the time of the decision, when it was decided that I was going to be teaming up with JT, I was like, oh, really? Like, you know, <laughs> I, w- I would have <laughs> I would have liked someone whom I maybe had this perception of as being a, a stronger competitor. I never thought I was that we were going to be 7-0 and still standing with the belts. JT has really 
he he complements my game. He knows all my holes, and, and he has plenty of his own, and, and I do my best to fill those. Had you guys even met before you had that fateful hug on the night of the decision? Yes, we had because JT was the engineer for Meet the Movie Press. Um, right. So yeah, he was in the booth for a long time, and I knew he was a Patriots fan, and, and maybe it was just that he got ditched or whatever, and, and I was a Boston guy, and so that's why Christian sort of masterminded this idea to, to pair us together. It was that Boston connection, but hey, it's proven uh, to be effective. Well, let's get to the recap and break down the action, starting with the pre-match hoopla. Modoc dressed like Boris and Natasha of Rocky and Bullwinkle fame. So not only did nobody understand their new team name, Modoc, nobody understood their characters either. So they were off to a flying start. Now, the Den, of course, you guys mocked their new name. Jeff, you went after Gray big time, which I think is a bit unfair since she's better than the pizza guy after all. So what's with you and Gray? Hey, I, I love Gray Jake. I was uh, giving her a hard time. I like to pick on the who I imagine to be the psychologically weaker uh, <laughs> opponent. You know, So I wanted to get in Gray's head because I thought that if she was – a little rattled, maybe a little intimidated. She wouldn't step up the way that I knew Atchity would need her to step up. Um, as far as their characters, I like what they try to do and they do make each match entertaining and I like that they have you know their own shtick for each match. But it's hard to stay in character for 35 minutes. As you saw, it was just a, a lot happening. It's exhausting playing this game alone, playing this game in character. I can only imagine how exhausting that must be. I mean, is that the correct I, statement? Technically, JT and JT and I are playing in character, but yeah, no, we we have to stay in in character too. It's just, um, yeah, it is exhausting. And watching it with my staff today, they were all like, "Oh God, this Russian accent is so annoying." I'm seeing it in the YouTube comments too, so I'd be surprised if actually brought that one back. Now, the Den came out in full force for their entrance for your entrance. Snyder, was that a pixie stick that you downed? That's right. They have pixie sticks up at Collider Video, and I was just eating one beforehand. I was like, you know what? I'm going to save it and then just dump it all in my mouth right when I, right when I go on camera. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I think the pixie stick got lined with too much saliva, <laughs> and none of the sugar really poured out onto my tongue on camera. It was all just kind of stuck in the tube. So, oh, well. Aaron Turner, did you know that pixie sticks were still in business? I did not, I, but I'm glad that I'm getting all this inside baseball at the moment. I think that's, that's right. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. We'll go ahead and trademark that. That's a show property. Uh, speaking, of, mm. speaking of trademark, Dagnino tested the markers right before the match to make sure that they were in working condition as a proper manager. Should. I call that, so, yeah, I call that earning his paycheck, you know? Yeah, that's a, a nice uh, continuation of a previous episode, previous match. Good callback. Good callback from Tom. Well, round one, question one, Frank Horrigan in the line of fire. Of course, that's Clint Eastwood, two to two. Question two, 2012 stop motion animated film, Paranorman, four to four at this point. Question now, wait a second. There's controversy on this Paranorman question, which I admittedly, I, I, I don't recall it from the match. Just people are saying that, that JT did not write Paranorman and that he wrote Paranormia and just said Paranorman. As you can hear, I'm trying to sweep it under the rug. I don't, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, I'll, I'll own up <laughs> to things. I just honestly, no one saw that on his board there. No one said anything during the match. These things happen in sports sometimes. There's somebody missed it or it actually did say Paranorman. And Look, these are I, things I we've talked about with Christian. There are certain rules that have to be addressed before the 2018 season at a rules summit in Colorado. And hopefully this subject will be addressed <laughs> where someone pronounces an answer after they've already had a chance to hear other people's pronunciations. So this is one of many issues that they will iron out in the future so this can happen anyway it just i mean listen if you were to inspect every single board really closely you'd probably only find that mine are correct everyone has so many typos i was fine with it i saw it too but I right because you just glance you just glance the board at the camera but it's what you're saying that is what the judges are going off of and of course if someone pronounces it one way before you you're just going to repeat that pronunciation you know it's that kind of a thing yeah Anyways, question three, Lone Ranger's horse that is silver. Six to five, Modoc took the lead at this point. Patriots don't panic, but Jeff, you're down by one. Is there any sort of concern when it's so early in round one? No, not yet, I don't think. Um, I don't think the panic or anything really sets in until after round two. Because at that point, there's a lot of points. You know, There's 16 points in round one, 12 points in round two. That's 28 points are off the board. And now you know you got to make every single one count. Well, question four, Tatum, Riley, and Scream. Of course, that's Rose McGowan. That tied things up at seven. 
Question mm. five, 72's Cabaret, the director, the only person to get this was our esteemed guest, Mr. Jeff Snyder. Bob Fosse? Bob Fosse, that's correct. Yeah, I'm surprised uh, that others didn't get that, that Gray or Matt didn't get that. I didn't really expect JTE to, but yeah, Fosse, you know, from the birdcage dance, Fosse, 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 right. Martha right. Graham, Martha Graham. Well, it's eight to seven Patriots at this point. Question six, another easy question, Jack Black in Orange County. Yeah. 10 to 8 Patriots at this point. I'd point. agree, miss that, you know, with the brother. Question 7, trapped in time, surrounded by evil, low on gas, oh, okay. army of darkness, 11 to 9 Patriots at this point. So wait, let's talk about this one. This was, this was yeah. a big one because people have been talking about this. So she she said army of darkness 3. And then, and then you know, there was discussion and she decided not to challenge. What do you guys think of that? The question of a challenge came up, but why challenge when – Christian basically dared Atchity to challenge by telling him that they only take theatrical titles. So warn them they were going to lose before challenging. I really don't think that they had a case um, there. It's like calling Die Hard 3 or Die Hard with a Vengeance Die Hard 3. It is, the movie is called Die Hard with a Vengeance. That's its name. To say Die Hard 3, I don't think that would be an acceptable answer. So why would Evil Dead 3 be an answer? Yeah, the same thing with like Lord of the Rings or something. It's called Return of the King, not Lord of the Rings 3. So it's kind of... I, yeah. I didn't think they were going to win either, so that's it. Yeah, I, I was. Props confident. to her for knowing that, though. I, I, it was like I just kept thinking of gas as in a car and not as in a chainsaw. So, if you know Edge of Tomorrow, don't get cute by trying to answer with live, die, repeat. Just go yeah. with the safe answer. Mm-hmm. Well, question eight, the last question of round one. Alexander Dario's ex-boyfriend Logan Lerman played Percy Jackson in those movies that nobody saw. Twelve to ten Patriots. Jeff, give me your overall round one thoughts at this point. Round one, I, I just I knew that that Modoc had come to play. I knew that they were serious. Pretty typical round one. I thought we got off to a nice start. I would have liked the perfect round and to get a chance at that bonus. But yeah, I wasn't even close on uh, the Army of Darkness question. Since I'm sitting in the the Brian David's position here, I would like to make a Brian David's type statement here, and that w- that is with question four, the Rose McGowan question. Number one. It's actually not correct in the question. It, the question at the end states that she was in both Grindhouse and Planet Terror. She's in Planet yeah. Terror and right. Death Proof, but collectively they're known as Grindhouse. I'm a purist. I had a problem with that. But anyway, I just didn't like the question structure overall because it's like, okay, Rose McGowan was a character in Scream, but she's also known for these other yeah. two movies. That's kind of like a I, kind of a cheat. I am a hundred percent with you. I thought the question should have just a- stopped after Scream. Why are we giving more roles that the actress is in? Obviously, exactly. Nev Campbell is not in Death Proof or something. That was a, a case of a question with too much information um, and that kind of telegraphed the answer. Because I think if you just said who played Tatum in Scream, I don't think everybody gets it. I, tr- I think you're exactly right. Tricky Skaliski has said this before in the comments, so I'm going to bring it up just because he said it before. But he says on occasion that. He will purposely make the questions a bit more complicated to make the players work for it. But my response to that has always been the work should be getting the answer, not understanding the questions. You guys can't read the questions. The wording has to be relatively straightforward, in my opinion. I've actually got some inside dirt on this question that it actually was not written by uh, Chris Skaliski. This question was actually submitted by Mark Ellis. So there you go. Aaron, I prefer my version of events, but thank you. (laughs) Okay. Well, round two, again, it's 12 to 10. Patriot Snyder, you took a great shot at Christian before spinning by asking <laughs> Ken to judge your spin. Well played, sir. Yeah, th- thank you very much. It was another good callback. My strategy, as I told JT before, is always uh, spin first um, because you don't want the opponent to spin first and then get the category that you want. So if you've looked at any of our matches, I'm pretty sure we always spun first if we had the opportunity. You guys spun disaster movies. So first reaction to getting disaster movies, is this a strength of yours? Is it just kind of in between? I would not have chosen disaster movies, but JTE felt really confident in it. And he also reminded me that there's really so very few disaster movies out there. I mean, it's a pretty small pool and we're very familiar with the big titles. So it made a lot of sense to just trust JTE uh, and go with something, uh, a, a, you know, something that he's strong at. Because if we spun again and got classics, we would have been screwed. Well, question one, Michael Rourke, Tommy Lee Jones in Volcano, 14 to 10 Patriots. Question two, Jill and Hall's love interest, Day After Tomorrow. Dude, oh, this one, I, I turned to him, I go, it's Emmy Rossum. And he was like, oh, is it 
I'm, I'm not sure. And then he made me go multiple choice. If we had lost by a point instead of won by a point, forget Army of Darkness, forget all this other stuff. I would have gone right back to that day after tomorrow question because I knew that cold. And, and he just was like insisted upon multiple choice. Well, 15 to 10 Patriots at this point. Question three. This seemed to be all JTE. The 1970s ship capsizes at sea. That's Poseidon Adventures. Dude, he almost said Poseidon, though. Which is, you know, the remake. The remake, yeah. Right, but that's not the title of that movie. And I, 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 yeah, that would have been really What's that title? It's just the Poseidon Adventure. And oh, the remake's just called Poseidon. Right, exactly. Okay. So if he had just said Poseidon, I was going to be upset. Well, 17 to 10, Patriots. Question four, Newman's co-star in Towering Inferno. Steve McQueen, you guys are pretty thrown off by this question. Since yeah. there were a lot of actors in this film. Yeah, that question's got to be, got to be, you know, worded better. I mean... Because we could have named 10 different actors and, and they weren't Steve McQueen, you know. Just be a little bit more specific on that question, Chris, I think. Aaron Turner, did Mark Ellis write this question as well? Not that I heard. Not that I heard. Well, 19 to 10 Patriots. In question five, Vigo Mortensen played Ray, Roy Nord in Daylight. Great pull from JT. I, I would not have remembered that. I knew he was going to get that just because it's a Stallone film, as we all did. 21 to 10 Patriots. Question six. Easiest question of the night, perhaps. Matt Reeves, director of Cloverfield, 23 to 10 Patriots. 11 point turn out of 12 points available. Right. And the, Andy Ross was the only one we missed. So he should have gone perfect 12 for 12. Well, either way, that's called dominance. Jeff, what was your headspace during and after this dominant round? Well, I mean, it was, we're in a great position. I think we were up, what'd you say, 13 by that point? Because we got 11, we were up two before. So we're up 13. They have a max of 12 points. So I go, no matter what, we're heading into the, to the round three with a lead, number one, even if they go perfect. And also, once they eventually spun and wound up with sports movies, I was like, oh, wow, this is over. Is it easier for you, you think, to get these like director questions? Because I feel yes. like that's something that's like right in your wheelhouse. Yes. I mean, you, I think you, they even say, what is it? Maybe it's, is it round? What is it? Yeah. It's round, round five. When they say the two point question, we got directors. I know people have said, why don't you give JTE the two point question? And I take the three point question. Directors is just something I know stone cold. So as yeah. soon as it came up, it was like, all right, I just have to trust that the third, that the three point question is a category that JTE knows. Cause I, I can't pass on directors. Yeah, you don't want to leave points on the table, so take the short exactly. path. We're going to come back to the two-point and three-pointer strategy later, just a forewarning. But Modoc spun musicals. They spun again for sports movies. So this was a highly stealable category, if that's a word. Question one, remember, remember the Titans quarterback nickname, multiple choice, Sunshine, 23-11 Patriots. Question two, Slapshot's coach, Paul Newman, 23 to 13 Patriots. Actually playing games with that answer, by the way. Yeah. Actually foreshadowed events later in this match as he do these big windups before answering. Right. And when you're doing it in character, like I said, it's bound to be exhausting. So this question told us what was to come later in this match. Right. Like he, he was saying, I could clearly see what he was going for. He was like Steve McQueen's co-star right. in the Tower Inferno. But when you're, when the first word out of your mouth is Steve McQueen, right. it's like, you know, a, a judge could have ruled against him there. I, I'm glad that they didn't, but they could have. Question three, any given Sunday's commissioner, multiple choice, Charlton Heston, 23 to 14 Patriots, nine point lead at that point. Question four, dodgeball was on what network? The Ocho ESPN eight, 23 to 16 Patriots, seven point lead. Question five, one of Jeff Snyder's favorite 2016 films. Eddie Edwards was from what country in Eddie the Eagle, or he represented what country? Great Britain, 23 to 18. I'm surprised Patriots. they got that, by the way, because England is not technically the right answer. I, that's what I thought that they were going to say. Question six. Oh my God. Question six. The fighters, director, multiple choice. Are you kidding me? Yeah. David O. Russell, 23 to 19 Patriots, four point lead. This killed them in hindsight. This was devastating. You cannot let a point like this go. They definitely left some points on the board in, in round two, uh, going to, to multiple choice maybe a little too often. But at the same time, we didn't get a chance to steal, if I remember correctly. Nope. So, you know, I mean, more credit to them. They took a category that they maybe, maybe weren't the strongest at, and they managed not to give up any points to us. 
It's the end of a nine point turn out of 12 available points for Modoc. There were no steals or steal opportunities for either team in one of the best round twos you can ask for on both sides. I made an observation around question. Uh, I think it's around four or five for uh, Modoc. You can see Gray start to look down. Like she's kind of thinking, oh man, like we might be in, in over our head here. And that's. That's something I noticed right away. The body language had changed, and just the way they talked to each other when they were conferring, it changed a little bit. And I was like, wait a second. They're they're a little rattled here. So that's what I took away immediately. I was actually surprised they did as well as they did in sports films when they spun it in the look on their face there as well. So, I mean, I, I got to give them props, though. They, had, they hung in there. Absolutely. They had a really good round two, and it set them up for, for round three. Well, round three, the boring round, excuse me, the betting round. I slip with the tongue. I'm, I'm so used to being in the heel chair. Total accident. <laughs> Snyder, you spun classics. The question, what is Rosebud in Citizen Kane? Of course, that's a sled. The reveal, Pat's bet one, Modoc bet three. It's now 24-22 Patriots. Jeff, I know you guys don't panic, but were you thrown by this question and your your amount that you put on the line. I mean, it's tough. Yes. Uh, I, I first of all, if you don't get this question right, you shouldn't even be playing in the showdown to begin with. Yeah. Um, it's tough to lose two points on something like that. I mean, when you spin classics, yeah, I'm, I'm expecting a tricky question, some degree of difficulty there, which is why we only bet one point, and maybe we should have been more aggressive and had more faith in our ability in classics. You know, we, we played it a little safe. They had they were down big, so they had to go for it with a three-pointer. Um, and then to get a question like that, it's like, wow, that's a three-point question? So that was a bummer. It's interesting. They had the savvy to go for three points as a veteran team would. They had to. They really had to, though, you know, being down like they were. Of course, and this will set up some points in round four. I mean, they had the savvy of how you play the betting round, despite probably not playing the betting round all that often. Yeah, they played the betting around in the old school showdown, but totally different game now. But I've said many times that I don't like the betting round as it's anticlimactic compared to the other four rounds. I've never said to do away with it. I've simply said it needs tweaking just like every other round has been tweaked to varying degrees. Perhaps if they made the point reveals a bit more dramatic, maybe then the round would have a bit more excitement like the speed or wheel round. Maybe add some Jeopardy music. I'm not sure. Maybe that maybe that'll help. I'm glad that Modoc got some confidence back with this answer. And I was uh not surprised at a low betting total from the Patriots side because good lord, classics has been such a, a detriment to a lot of teams where it, it's just not something that's readily available to a lot of people. So I, I don't blame anybody for taking a one point answer, but I do agree with Jeff when he says that if you don't know that answer, then you probably should be in the showdown. Well, round four, it's 24, 22 Patriots, the infamous round four. question one. Who directed the Ben Affleck led film gone girl that Matt actually, uh, that would be David Fincher. David Fincher is correct. Right. All right. Um, now, uh, next, next question. And no more. That would be just answer the question. Actually right out of the gate show that he was dragging his feet on this answer. And even though two seconds had expired, Christian gave it to him anyway. So don't blame Christian or the league for actually not knowing the rules at this point. Christian even warned him that he had to buzz in with the answer ready. So they gave him this point, but they weren't going to give it to him again if he dragged his feet. So once again, this set up things that were to come. And Jeff, you were flailing your arms when he dragged his feet on this question. You were already sensing what this was going to be like. And uh, were you upset that they gave him the point on this? No, actually. Uh, the Fincher one, I thought he got, um, and it didn't feel like I, maybe you timed it. Uh, it didn't did. feel like two, did. it, it didn't feel like two seconds elapsed. I thought he got that one, but yes, the, my hands were going up. First of all, when, once he hits the buzzer and doesn't have the immediate answer, right? Yeah. I'm going to do anything I can to distract him and make those tech two seconds go by. <laughs> you know, I think throwing up your hands and acting uh, outraged is just a smart strategy. But no, I wasn't really upset about the Fincher one. The Tom Hanks one, that's the next one, right? 
No, we'll get there. But he oh, again, sorry. he showed that he had this long wind up once again. So right, it was that would be right. Was that was that the one? That would be uh yeah. That would be uh so so. Question two on Wednesday we wear pink. Gray chimes in right away. Mean yeah, girls. Didn't, I didn't. I didn't know that. That was uh, Aaron Turner's senior quote in high school. Twenty four. Twenty four. Love the film. Ty. Name one of the three romantic comedy films that starred Tom Hanks and make. That is who is that? That, that is actually. me, and it would be why. Well, that's it, two seconds. It, uh, what? The yeah, point. yeah. You, you said that would be. You got. You got to buzz in, and you got to say it. That would be. That you lose a point there. Twenty-four, twenty-three. You can't say that would be. You got to just say it. All right. Once again, despite Christian's warnings, Ashley buzzed in first without an answer ready, as he stalled for more time by saying that would be. Uh, plus, he kept his Boris character going. To a fault. So once again, the energy that Modoc used really sucked them out of this match. I think. And did he get the point on that one? I uh, know this is when they cut him off. I, I just felt like Ashley was buzzing super quickly. That Tom Hanks question was barely out of out of his mouth. I had no time to think about it by the time Ashley buzzed. But his priority was buzzing in first, not right. buzzing in first with the answer. When he had the answer, go. exactly, exactly. And I've harped about this so many times because the priority should be on having the having the answer first, not buzzing in first. But this is where inexperience in the speed round comes into play. It's a different game in the speed round because not only do you have to answer and recall something quick, you can lose points. And that's a big deal, especially in a close championship match. I hate to say it. I'm a big fan of Ashley, but I think he really let the team down here. This is exactly why I've been pushing for an added steal opportunity in the event of a non-answer because mm -hmm. Ashley wouldn't dare pull this if he knew the consequence would be double the points. But moving to question four, Killian Murphy as Scarecrow in Nolan's films. I love how Jeff, you gave the right answer. Yeah. And yet there was a delay in giving you the point since the league probably didn't realize that Killian was the proper pronunciation. They were probably yes, they all Killian. think it's Cillian. Exactly. <laughs> it's just through the mark. 100 what happened there. <laughs> I loved it. Well, uh, La Chifra in Casino Royale, that's played by Maz Mickelson. Who played La Chief in 2006 Casino Royale? Uh, uh, shit. All right, there you go. So 25-22. Ratchety completed the holy trinity of speed round meltdowns. He buzzed in before anybody else on three occasions because he didn't have an answer ready on three different occasions. So once again, right. he showed how not to play the speed round. So they buzzed on four of the five. They got two right and they got they fumbled two of them so that they ultimately nullified. didn't get any points. And we got one point. Actually nullified the first two points that they right. got. Exactly right. right. So right. which cost them big time. Such a meltdown, such a meltdown that we'll be talking about for a long time. So Matt, Matt needs to learn real quick not to buzz in without an answer ready. And if you're playing in a title match, you've got to do your homework when it comes to speed rounds. They should not be yes. teaching him how to play exactly. on the spot. This is something you've got to go in knowing. Yep, you have to watch a few championship matches, study your opponent a little bit, and just to get a feel for the format since you've never done it before. So, again, he, he paid the price for not doing his homework and not knowing how the speed round works. He emphasized being first, not being right, and they paid for it dearly. This is why the Patriots are the champions, folks. They do their homework. Question three, he was still in character, and that, that just I, – I cannot understand why you would remain in character at that point in a speed round. You've got to be sharp at this point. Question five, he dropped the character for a second, but it was too late at that point. They're not – rookies <laughs> they're they're veterans of this league they've been around for a long time and this Long enough. exactly and this is their only shot at the titles right now you got to come in a little bit sharper i appreciate the character work and the and the deep commitment to it but at some point you got to realize why you're actually there so that that was disappointing to me they may be veterans but they're rookies in this particular five round format so i'm going to ask jeff about that later but moving to round five 25 to 22 patriots modok gets their two-pointer billy and saint elmo's fire that's rob Lowe. patriots up one 25 24 modok gets their three-pointer how the heck did gray know all spark from transformers this is why this is why I will never discount her skills like I do the pizza guys because she <laughs> comes up big in the final round. So, Jeff, when she pulled All Spark, were you just beside yourself? 
I was I was surprised. I mean, you know, they were up two at that point, and I and we had three questions to go. Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't sweating it at that point. Um, but yeah, I, w- I was certainly impressed. I didn't think she was going to get it. I wouldn't but, have gotten it. I think that, that would have been a JT question. Well, Patriots two pointer, Jurassic Park three's director Jeff. You didn't even hesitate, Joe Johnston, tying it up at twenty seven. Joe Johnson, I, don't, I didn't think it was a particularly challenging question. J, I, I felt like JT was a little nervous. He thought I was going to blow it. But yeah, again, like I said, director's kind of a strength. The Patriots, your three-pointer. This is Benjamin. He's a little worried about his future. It's from The Graduate. JTE couldn't oh. pull it, though. Oh, man. Did 1967, you know a classic. Benjamin, come on, bro. I was going to – I would have yelled at him if we had lost the game because of that. So just to clarify, you knew this answer. Yes, absolutely. That's why I was like, you know, freaking out. Again, it, it, for all intents and purposes, it's, a, it's classics. That's what the graduate is. Uh, and I knew that JT wouldn't get it. Well, Modoc's five pointer, Dr. Jeffrey Wigan, played by oh, Russell yeah. Crowe in The Insider, 32 27. Modoc, Jeff, were you beside yourself when your namesake potentially cost you a win? First of all, that's a five point question. Who starred in the friggin' Insider? Come on. I thought that was so easy. It's one of my favorite movies. That I, I think it's honestly Russell Crowe's best performance, too. Better than Gladiator and A Beautiful Mind and LA Confidential. Um, so, yeah, I was just bummed it wasn't my, my five point question. And uh, the Patriots, your five pointer, Riley from Inside Out. She moves to San Francisco, 32 all. We were nervous with the Pixar category because that could have gone either way. But uh, as soon as they asked that inside out question, JT and I both knew it. We, we just turned to each other and said San Francisco. And she came from Minnesota. so Right. See, I knew the Minnesota part. I did not remember the San Francisco part. Some people in the comments are saying that's way too easy for a five-pointer. I it disagree. I, I think it was easy. It wasn't quite as easy as who started the insider. Ahem. But, uh, but yeah, I thought both five-point questions were easy in this match. Maybe it's more of a three, but it's not an easy question. It's not a gimme answer. That's fair, but it's a free throw rather than the three pointer, you know? What a match. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm really surprised at how the, the fortitude of Modoc to hang in there when I really thought they were done. And JTE, I, I, you know, I've never seen Inside Out. Sorry. And uh, the Pixar category has been such a, a death nail for so many teams. <laughs> But just seeing the look on JT's face when he like put his hands out, I knew that he knew it. I knew that we were going to overtime. I was pretty happy about this because two of the best teams that we've ever had, probably the two best teams in the history of the team league going into overtime, only fitting. Well, sudden death. Once again, sudden death rules were tweaked for a more exciting format. I'm not sure why round three isn't given the same treatment, but maybe one day. It's now the same questions for both teams until there's a lead. Question one, let's roll the clip. What 90s comedy will you hear the following quote? We got no food. We got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off. And five, four, three, two, one. Pens down, Jeff Snyder. All right, here we go. JTE. Dumb and Dumber. Gray Drake. <laughs> Friday. Jeff Snyder. Baby's kids. And Matt Atchley. I have no idea. Oh, my God. And the boy, your winner! The only person to answer, that's JTE with Dumb and Dumber, 33-32. The Patriots hold on to the titles for the fourth time in 2017. Jeff Snyder, how does it feel once again? Oh my God, I was on cloud nine because I would I felt so bad that I didn't know it. And you can see like JT's already out of the seat celebrating by the time it hits me what has happened. Cause I wasn't sure what the format was. Like I I honestly didn't get it. I thought we were gonna have to answer another question. Right. So when you know Christian started screaming and JT started celebrating, it took me a second but there before I was like, Oh, that's it. It's over. I was very surprised that actually didn't write anything at all and take a stab. Greg guessed Friday and I guessed Bebe's kids because I was just thinking in a live action movie, what pet's head would be falling off? Like that would be really messed up. Uh, so I figured it was some kind of animated movie. Uh, but so credit to JT for saving the day. And the next person who hits YouTube and says that he's dead weight and I'm just carrying him, I'm going to play that clip for them because that was an absolutely huge pull and he should be in the conversation for player of the year. 
I think Atchity was trying to write the answer in Russian. I think that's why he didn't have an answer in time. Uh, just a thought. <laughs> Not the time to get fancy, that's for sure. That format, I, I, I guess, I don't know. It was interesting. It was different. Uh, and, and I like that if two people got it compared to one person, the two people, you know, they would have won the match. You know, like every member of the team, their knowledge matters rather than, you know, with the speed round where technically one person could have won the speed round. You know what I mean? I think it just lacked a little bit of the drama and pizzazz because it was like, it was like JT had the right answer. I believe he was the first one to even respond. So yes. then it was like, uh, you missed it, then Gray missed it, and then we're on to Atchity, who's like, all right, well, if Matt doesn't get it, I, I guess it's over. And then he didn't write anything. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like, well, we don't even have that drama. And it's like, eh, well, well, the Patriots won. It's like, wait a minute. Like with my Robert Duvall one, you're waiting to see, is that correct? Is you know, And, and you're waiting for Christian to announce who the winner is. And, and in this one, JT was just very confident. And as soon as Atchity said he didn't write anything, JT already knew he had won. So it, I think it affected Christian's call. But again, it's it's the circumstance where JT at that point was already sort of out of his chair. I thought the format had plenty of drama, but because it was a new format, I don't think everybody understood exactly how it worked. But I caught on to it relatively quick, and so I was leaping in unison with JTE because I just so happened to know the answer like he did. And while there's definitely some recency bias, I think this is the best team match that I've ever seen. I do feel for MODOK, though, because they had some opportunities to win this match, and I'm kind of disappointed that we won't see a rematch between these two teams for quite a while, perhaps the spring of 2018. Did they just get knocked down to the bottom of the pile again? They're not eligible for the tournament since the league doesn't want them to become number one contenders right after being number one contenders. However, if you're allowing bottom 10 to be in the tournament who last had a shot five weeks ago as the number one contender, then why not Modoc? You still have to earn that title shot by winning three to four matches as part of a 16-team tournament. The league also said up top that if you guys lost, you'd be eligible for a number one contender match at Spectacular. However, Modoc did not get that option. So, just like last year, Modoc will be on the shelf from September to February at least. And as a Schmodown fan, I'm disappointed that a Patriots Modoc sequel is out of reach for a long while, while Top 10 could have their third title shot in 12 months if they win the tournament. I think the Schmodown would, the, the ultimate Schmodown turn, team tournament would be better with Modoc in it. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's weird how that works. I don't Again, I don't make the rules, but uh, them's the breaks. So let's get to the interviews. Let's talk about the post-match interviews, because with the Patriots, even your interviews are must-see. Now, Grace, she said, I don't even know what to say. Dagnino chimes right in. I do. And he starts singing, see you in December. Yep. Did you guys have this plan, this December yes. bit? Yeah. Okay. As, soon, as soon as he started, uh, he, he said he was going to sing that. And so as soon as he started, uh, we, we had to chime in. Um, yeah, because it's, you know, a year, a, a full year. We're going to be back at the Spectacular defending the belts. Pretty impressive. How much premeditation goes into these post interviews? Do you guys talk about it for five minutes? Is it planned out before you arrive at the, the event? Well, it's like two minutes before. And it's just like, you know, Christian's like, these are the questions that we're going to ask and the points that we want you to hit. You know, make sure to get in Draco and RMB in there so they can introduce their name. Uh, you know, JT and I, I think, really went out of our way to show a lot of respect to Modoc because right. they really did take it, take us to the limit. Um, and it wasn't the kind of match like with top 10 where they're like, there's bad blood and a little bit of animosity. You know, th- these guys were, were fun and, and kind of harmless and that we almost looked past them. Um, almost. Yeah. You guys don't talk during people's wheel rounds as they're trying to answer questions. You guys show class. <laughs> during your matches. Yeah, and JTE was respectful. He said, they're better than most of these fanboy teams. I'm a professional movie watcher. But JTE, with the quote of the post-interview, I feel bad for the people who have to watch Spectacular because it's going to be a rerun. What a quote, Turner. Am I right? It's good stuff here, man. And I have great respect for Dan Merle. And I, and I swear I'm not saying this because Jeff is here, but the Patriots have shown whether a team called the Patriots is down 28 to three in the Super Bowl or they're down 25 to 23 to Modoc in a team tournament or a team championship, 
The Patriots are big time players, and big time players win big time. Merle is great, and with the right competitor, he could give us maybe our best match ever. But I don't think it's fair to say he's more dominant than us. I, I feel like he barely has to defend his title, and he hasn't beaten me. As far, you know, like I don't, I don't know if he beat G- JT or if JT's ever taken him on. Um, but yeah, I don't feel like Mer- Merle has really beaten the best in this league. Maybe we haven't either. But uh, but seven and zero, you can't you can't argue with that. We've won five championship matches in a row. Yeah, you guys are fighting champions. You've defended your belt on multiple occasions, and it's incredible. It's incredible to watch. You and JT are the most dominant champions that the Schmodown has ever had. Yeah, we'll we'll see uh, if the Schmodown can can produce a real um, an heir to the throne, if you will. Uh, you know whether that's going to be McWeenie and Sam Levine. They're a dangerous team. Um, the, the Malton Falcons, they could be, oh man, if they get their hands on those belts, they may never give them up. And then you've got teams like critically acclaimed late to the party. That's going to be a pretty good match. So we'll see. Don't sleep on Blofeld's cat. Your own stable mates as well. Could be of course. Of course. I, I, I would never, I would never. Well, let's move on to the Emma view. So Modoc, they're still in character, which is something that they maintain most of the match as we've been talking about. And this was to a fault. Emma Quote, she said they're nothing at all in regard to American men. This is the second consecutive week where Emma has fired shots at American and or Caucasian men. That's just kind of strange to me. I adore uh, Emma Fife off camera, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm in character right now. And I don't pay attention to what Emma Fife says in any postgame interview. JTE is money. Anyone who says JTE is not a great player, needs to have their head examined. I've been saying it for this entire year that I've been covering shows on this channel. He had belts in his future. Sure enough, he's got belts in the present. So let's go to the post credit scene. The Beast walked out of the bathroom. As soon as I saw this, I knew that they were going to do the didn't wash the hands bit. Probably <laughs> everybody knew they were going to do that. It, it was probably written by Fredo Knapsack the more I think about it, but... Am I the only one who's not remotely intrigued by the Beast playing Josh Mocha? It just feels like the Beast is the better player without question. It's like, why even go through all these matches and build up when everybody seems to know the Beast is better? Am I off base on this? I've said it many times. I think Bibiani versus McWeeny is your money match. I think that's a match that everybody wants to see. Let, uh, Let Roka go start a rivalry with Burnett or somebody like... I just I don't have any interest in Bibiani and Roca against each other. I'm sure it'd be a fine match, but I just I have zero interest. Oh, I I, I do because Bibiani and Roca are two of the the best talkers in the league. I would love to see them go up against each other. I don't know where this idea that Bibiani is the you know god of movie trivia. I don't know where that came from. To me, he has not earned it. Bibs you know, could hit the books a little bit harder. And there's a conflict of interest here, of course, but. What's the conflict of interest? Well, Roka works for you now. And- oh, no, no, no. Fuck that kid. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that, yeah. like him, him working for me uh, is, is one thing, but I'm still going to talk plenty of shit to him. And when he, and he, you know, he types shit when he sends in his articles too. No, no love lost there. As far as we're concerned, we are still characters who, who do not like each other, uh, but yeah. Well, Jeff, let me ask you some questions. Some of these are fan questions. Some of these are from Aaron and Frank and myself. So where is your head at right now concerning singles? What is your your mindset right now? Is, is it hard to go back and forth between the two? It's, it is definitely different. Um, listen, I, I just want to redeem myself. I feel like I have a very mediocre record in singles. It's four and three. I, but, but when you look like, and this is four and three plus seven and oh. So I'm 11 and three. Sam Levine came down to the last question. Christian came down to the last question. I don't count Stuckman. Right. And Stuckman, again, just an off day, as you guys know, for personal reasons. So, um, so yeah, I feel like I'm two questions away essentially from being 10 and 0, so to speak, if we just forget the Stuckman match never happened, uh, two questions away from being 10 and 0, but the, but my four and three record does not reflect that. So I, I, you know, I've got to do something in this tournament. It's going to start, with the pizza boy, Matt Nost. I thought I was taking on the crusher. That doesn't seem to be the case. It's me versus Nost. Yeah, he, he's he's in for a bruising. Friend of the show, Frank Janish asks, how do you decide who takes the first final round question if you're both strong in it? He adds, Snyder has taken the first question 
all season while JTE has taken the three pointer all season. So did you realize that? Do you take all the? I guess I haven't. I mean, it, listen. It, it, if we got action adventure, or Sl- Sly and Arnie, uh, if we pit that category for the two pointer, JT would do it. I guess it's just sort of the way it's broken it down. Like you know, I think there's been horror thrillers and crime movies and directors. These are all my strengths, so maybe that's why I've taken the f- question first. I really don't put a lot of stock in the well. This is two points, and this is three points, and the stronger player should always take the three point question. You want to take the points when you think you can get them. You know, as they come. Of Available to you. So it wasn't intentional that you have been answering the first question. Not at all. I mean, it's really simply what is this category? Who knows it best? And we'll deal with the next category when it comes. Michael Campbell asks How much did the change to five rounds versus three affect Modoc per your experience? I think it's a big adjustment, actually. Clearly, they, they weren't used to it. Uh, and it did seem to affect the match. But you've gone from three rounds to five rounds. I mean, it's got to be a bit jarring to suddenly play in a much longer match and have to keep that level of focus going. Yeah, again, the third the third round um, you know, in a championship match is, is just a one question thing. So, so it's like it, it's, it's like it never happened almost. Uh, <laughs> the only real difference is, is the speed round. Um, and yeah, that's hand-eye coordination, reflexes, uh, knowing how much of the question you actually need. Because, you know, like you said, Chris gets tricky. Tricky Skalicki. uh, And I feel like it's those speed round questions that he gets tricky almost on purpose, trying to get you to slap that buzzer, you know, before the question takes a complete, like, you know, right turn into another direction. Now, Jeff, I know it's got to make you a little bit confident that you are the champions going in. You guys defended, you're undefeated. You defended these belts so many times. Is it still nerve wracking every time you step on the uh, Schmodown stage, if you will, or at this point, is it, just, is it just an old hat? Great question. Um, honestly, gets more and more nerve wracking each time because the stakes are that much bigger. The wow. fall, you know, we, we, we've come so far, climbed so high up that ladder. Now th- we're set up for a big fall. Uh, and believe me, when, when Modoc went up five points there at the end, right before we got our Pixar question, I had my whole like life flash before my eyes it, in a sense, my Schmodown life. It was like, oh man, if we don't get this, I'm not the champ anymore. I'm, I'm a loser. It's going to ruin my weekend. I'm going to be bummed tonight. Uh, I'm going to have to change my Twitter bio. Like for better or worse, <laughs> my identity has become very wrapped up as in, in the guise of Schmodown champion. And I would hate to lose that. So I'm going to do everything I can to keep it going for as long as I can. Although, you know, everything, every, all good things come to an end. I don't, I don't anticipate to uh, just going undefeated the rest of my life. There are, there will be someone out there who catches me on a bad day. Like Chris Stuckman did or the Patriots on a bad day. Who's going to take us down, but I just don't know if they're in the league yet. Well, I will follow up my great question with kind of a silly one. I noticed that you uh, were not rocking the toothpick in this episode. Um, Is that something you're hoping to bring back in the future? If you guys want the toothpick back, back, I will bring it back. Um, I really just think I left them in my car. Uh, (laughs) I don't know. I I, I would like to see the toothpick come back, and I would even like you to take it a step further and either throw it into the camera as you come out or throw it into your opponent's face. I'll keep keep that in mind, although I I did uh, make sure to grab one of those uh, MODOK bombs. (laughs) <laughs> and I go up to the that. camera and, and drop that bomb right on their face. That was great. Jeff, your career is about telling people what they need to know. Is there anything that we need to know about this match or the Patriots in general? We play the heels. We embrace villainy. We don't shy away from it. But I think you guys are starting to, to learn and I think you're starting to see in the comment section on YouTube. We're just fun guys uh, and, and we are winning people over. Um, so I don't anticipate a face turn or anything like that, but yeah. I, I think, uh, I think fans are, are, are growing and people, more people want us to win. So yeah, I, I'm just saying, don't judge a book by its cover. JT and I, not as bad as uh, all those boos at the beginning of every match make a sound. Well, that was Jeff, the in Snyder Snyder folks telling us everything we needed to know about his big championship defense. People can find you of course, as the editor in chief at tracking hyphenboard.com where else can people find more of you and your work 
I'm at the Insider on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure to follow. Make sure to follow my tracking board on Twitter. Uh, we have big things coming to the site, guys. I, I, I hired Drew McWeeny and Ed Douglas from Coming Soon for a reason. Uh, we're going to have a name change. We're going to have a redesign. There's big things in the pipeline for the tracking board. So uh, be sure to keep checking that site. We appreciate your patronage. Uh, you know, tune in to Meet the Movie Press uh, on Friday mornings at 9 a.m. On, on Popcorn Talk Network on After Buzz. And that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that was Jeff Snyder. Congratulations to him once again. We can't thank him enough for all his time and candor. Before we move to our next segment, I caught up with Jeff's team partner, JTE, after the big win against Modoc to hear what he had to say to all of his critics. <laughs> JTE with yet another title defense in the books. What would you like to say to everyone who doubted you? Keep on doubting everybody. What else do we need to prove? And here's what I love about me and Jeff as a team. We don't just blow people out of the water because let's be honest, there's a lot of good players in this league and that's not going to happen all the time. We win the close matches and those I'm actually more proud of these close overtime matches wins than I am than the knockout like we wipe the floor with top 10 because it really shows you when it comes down to nitty gritty we're gonna pull it out we're that good of players jte congratulations on your fourth title defense it's an honor to watch your team the patriots play and i can't wait to tell my grandkids that i witnessed both patriots dynasties in person it's a magical time to be a patriots fan on any side of the sport All right, I hope everyone enjoyed the Patriots Modoc team title recap with Jeff Snyder and some guy named Aaron Turner. I'm now rejoined by Stat Commander Winky, Frank Janish, who bailed on me right before that very team title recap. Luckily, Aaron Turner once again was able to do his best Willis Reed impression. Frank, do you have anything you want to say about your sudden disappearance? Yeah, I was able to make it back for this uh, for this thing. Yeah. Frank, I was hoping you'd apologize to the audience and take some accountability for your actions, but apparently that's no longer a thing in 2017. But since you missed the recap, I'd still love to hear your thoughts on the team title match, including some of those hot stats you'd like to cook up for us. Was this the best team match we've ever seen? Good question, Brian. Was it the best match I've ever seen? And to that, I will say... Maybe the best team match you've ever seen. The best team match, yeah, I think I'll say maybe because if we go back and look at the Wolves of Steel match, the first two rounds were as competitive as any title match we've seen the Patriots in. It was not as competitive as this Patriots Modoc match. Yeah, Wolves of Steel gave the Patriots a run for their money. Trek gave the Patriots a run for their money in sudden death. The only team that couldn't give the Patriots a run for their money was bottom 10. The one thing that the Wolves of Steel can do better than Modoc is hang with the Patriots for these first two rounds. Modoc is generally a very average team coming through the first two rounds, which puts them in a very bad position going into that third and fourth round. However, I think if Modoc was given another chance in this speed round, knowing how it flows and how it goes, I think it's pretty competitive in terms of Modak putting some serious, serious pressure on the Patriots. And there's no doubt in my mind that Madge actually knew these questions or knew the answers to the questions. That's the thing about the speed round. Lots of people know the answers. The point is, who can draw them first? Modak has never played in a speed round or a title match before, and it showed. Matt clearly didn't do his homework as he was struggling with rules. The same can be said in round five. Champions do their homework. They come prepared. Christian gifted him the first Fincher question in round four, but he also warned him to answer immediately. And yet he still prioritized being first over being ready. And the fact that he remained in character during all this just made it even harder on himself. He dropped the act by question five, but... It was too little too late by then. Yeah, you know, I thought it was interesting that they kept the character throughout after the after their promo. I thought it was interesting that they stayed with it. And I know they like to have fun. I'm exhausted doing this show for an hour. I can't imagine playing a character while also playing five rounds of trivia. But Frank, you've argued against Aaron and I when we say things like Rachel's entrances affect her performance because they exhaust her. 
before the match, and she's kind of admitted to this a little bit, but do you think Modok's performance was affected by the fact that they kept Boris and Natasha going during the match? I don't. I just think... I really, I just, I don't. I just think Anthony knew the knew the answer. He's just gonna get there in time. Like I think he buzzed in knowing that. Oh yeah, I can figure out this answer. Not realizing how fast two seconds goes by, and I think that that's what really caught him, and and ultimately was the demise of Modok. We're arguing in circles now, but I would again say that his recall rate would have been sharper. It would have been quicker had he not used added energy on being Boris. If I spend all day talking on the phone before this podcast, I'm not going to be as sharp by the time I sit down to record this podcast. Anyway, do you have any interesting stats about this match that you'd like to share? Well, one of the things I was looking at for both these teams, Patriots and MODOK, was I want to know how well Patriots and MODOK do do through the first two rounds because that's really the only way we can kind of compare these teams because Modoc has never been in a five round format. And so when I looked at the Patriots heading into this match, they had answered 52 out of a possible 71 questions through their first two rounds this season only. I'm not counting the spectacular last year in December. They answered 73% correction rate with a point differential of plus nine. And they were averaging 21 points through the first two rounds. Now, when I looked at Modoc through their first three matches this season as well, they are answering 46 out of 74 for an average percentage of 62% correct with a differential of plus seven, averaging 19 points. Those averages pretty much came to fruition through the first two rounds. The Patriots had 23 points. Modoc had 19, which is pretty much in line with what happened here. The Patriots are just such a balanced team. Whenever one guy needs the other to step up, they almost always do. Snyder can get them an early lead while JTE can seal the deal like he did in this match. They're just impressive to watch. When I look at the round four, the speed round, they have been 10 out of 10 coming into this match. Five have been answered by JTE. Five have been answered for Snyder. So if that's not the definition of balance, I don't know what is. I hope people realize why they didn't get many answers in the speed round. It wasn't because they didn't know these questions. It was because of Achity's inexperience in speed rounds, as he was more concerned with being the first to buzz than being the first to buzz in with an answer ready. But I'm still just really disappointed that a patriots Modoc rematch is unlikely until the spring of 2018. They took the Patriots to sudden death and lost by only one after beating IGN and Nerds Watch. Those teams were good. If Bottom 10 gets a shot to play for their third title shot in 12 months, then there's no reason why Modoc should be denied a chance at their second shot when they'd still have to win a 16-team tournament to regain that number one contender status. Bottom 10 was just destroyed by the Patriots five weeks ago, and I can't understand for the life of me why Modoc Patriots number two isn't on everyone's wish list. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree with you in the terms that top 10 has a path to get back to a title match. I would love to see Modoc on that side of the bracket to go up against top 10 potentially in in the final four. Uh, or the final two on that side of the bracket, that would be tremendous because we've seen these two teams go at it before uh, last year and have a tremendous historic match, one for the books. And it's unfortunate that, yeah, we won't see Modoc in the tournament to begin with. But I do still think Wolves of Steel is worthy. And if you're on the other side of the bracket, could you see Wolves of Steel in top 10? In the final for the Schmodown tournament? I don't know. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, we've got plenty of things to talk about later, but let's not lose sight of the fact that we just had a fabulous title match between two great teams, and it's one of the best matches we've ever covered on the Schmodown Rundown. Frank, thanks for sharing your thoughts and your stats. Let's let everybody know our plans for next week, as we'll be releasing our usual episode next Saturday, only it'll be our version of Bracketology. We'll preview the team tournament now that it's starting a few days later. We'll also recap the movie trivia glowdown. So, as I mentioned up top, I said I would indulge in the fact that this episode marks my one-year anniversary 
on the channel. So I just want to share a few thoughts since we as a society love to celebrate anything and everything. While it's been an unusual experience, it's truly been a labor of love. And I want to thank Christian and Mark for allowing me to do this for as long as I've been doing it. I've met some incredible people along the way, especially my fellow rundowners, Aaron and Frank. RB3 has been unbelievable to me as well. I'm proud of a few things. I've never missed a show. I've never taken a week off. More importantly, I've never needed an incentive to do this. If I did, I wouldn't consider myself a true fan. And it takes a true fan to do the work that we do week in and week out. Whether it was the after show or now the rundown, I've shown up every week overprepared to a fault and given everything I possibly have to this channel and to you, the audience. If nothing else, I hope even my toughest critics can acknowledge that. I realize that the heel persona is divisive to some, perhaps many. However, I've always adhered to a code in terms of what I say. I don't go after people on a personal level. I may mock team names or trivia show characters, but there's a line I have yet to cross and will never cross. Well, since Aaron Turner always says, don't put yourself over, I'm just going to stop here. But in case anyone's wondering, I still don't have any tricks. Can you just repeat the question again? I'm sorry. So Frank, thank you for sitting through my waxing poetic. I know it's uh, <laughs> tough to listen to sometimes, but that's it for this week. Frank, let the good people know where they can find more of you. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankieJ29. And occasionally I pop up in the Movie Trivia Schmodown Facebook page. Go there if you're not already a part of it. Go there. There's a lot of good discussions. And I occasionally drop some stat nuggets there that uh, I think hopefully you'll find interesting. And you guys can follow me, Brian Davids, on Twitter at BDF331. Check out my TV film podcast at filmschlubspodcast.com or wherever podcasts are found. Again, thank you to Brian Ward at Brian E. Ward for his artwork contributions. And make sure to follow the show at SD Rundown, as well as our absent or is he absent host Aaron Turner at AT Titanium. On behalf of Frank Janish and Aaron Turner, this is Brian Davids signing off for Schmodown Rundown number 44.